Hello, hello. Are we live? Yep, we are up and running. Welcome back to the advent of Sintran. Today is day eight. So I, I had a couple problems yesterday in day seven. Oh, let me get my stream window. Chat window on top. There we go. Now that's always on top of all of my other windows. So I had a couple problems in day seven yesterday. Uh, I, I didn't know why bubble sort wasn't working, or at least why, why the while loop wasn't working inside bubble sort. So I put a for loop in here instead, which is less efficient because it will never break early, even if the array of hands is already sorted. Uh, whereas if the array of hands is already sorted, there should be one pass through here, and then we should immediately exit the while loop. Uh, turns out, uh, I think I had while while not swapped, or, or I had swapped set to false or something. Uh, it, I don't remember what I had. Y you can look at my commit on GitHub to see what I changed. But uh, this is supposed to be while swapped. It's supposed to be initialized to true, and then you set it to false inside the loop. Uh, I, I had quickly looked over the Wikipedia pseudocode too quickly uh, because this bubble sort, it's a repeat until. It's not a repeat while, it's a repeat until. And that's actually, it, until is the exact opposite of while. So until not swapped means while swapped. Uh, the other thing is that this is at the end of the loop. So this is like a loop and a half construct. So that means we have to do this at least once. And I do that by initializing swapped to true outside of the loop. Uh, yeah, so once I got that correct, the bubble sort works as it should. It's still not a super efficient sorting algorithm, but it's faster than if you have an outer loop for i equals one to n, instead of having a having a while or until loop that breaks early as soon as the array is sorted. Uh, it's, it's really annoying that they use this pseudocode on Wikipedia. Uh, I don't know if this is really pseudocode. I think this is based on Pascal because as far as I can tell, Pascal is the only programming language, or one of the only major ones at least, that has a repeat until construct. Most programming languages have while loops and do while loops. Do while loops are when you have the condition at the end like this, instead of having the condition at the top of the loop. Uh, but Pascal is the only one that has until instead of while. So I was really confused to see this. I was not expecting this. I just assumed it was a while loop without really actually reading it. Uh, and, and then I implemented the wrong thing for bubble sort. Uh, so as soon as I negated this condition, it works and it breaks early. And it actually runs in two minutes. Uh, I'm not sure if that was all because of the bubble sort thing or if it's if there's also a factor where, like, I, I don't really know how much memory OBS is using here. Uh, OBS, it's only using 173 megs. Uh, but I was thinking maybe, maybe because I'm streaming while I'm, I'm running this intensive code, uh, it takes longer than it should. Uh, but in, in either case, with the right bubble sort and when I run, ran this off stream, it ran in two minutes instead of 16. It still used up all my RAM on my shitty 16 gigabyte system, but it, it ran like eight times faster. Uh, and again, that's because I have terrible memory leaks in Sintran. But anyway, let's get into day eight. Make a directory, push D into that directory, and let's get the test input. I would still like to go back to day seven and do part two if I have time. Maybe, maybe Saturday or Sunday, I'll have time to do that. I'll probably do it off stream because Writing code takes energy, but streaming takes more energy than just writing code off stream. So I doubt that I will do day seven part two on stream. Anyway, uh, here's some test input, I guess. Why is this so slow? There we go. Like, even my text editor is slow. Like, launching NeoVim takes a few seconds on this computer. So don't expect a, 
poorly implemented high level interpretive language to run fast when we're we're sorting a list of 1000 poker hands with the worst sorting algorithm at least it's not bogo sort bogo sort is order factorial bubble sort is only order n squared uh we should be able to echo that input okay this is the input uh I'll have to read the prompt in a second, but I also want to save the real input. See, e even Google Chrome takes like a few seconds to bring up the file save dialog. Like everything is slow on this terrible computer. So what the hell are we doing here? Okay, we have maps. Ooh. Is this a grid problem or like a 2D map traversal problem? I loved these last year. Uh, let me finish reading it before I make any predictions. Okay, so we're, maybe we're in a maze. We start at triple A and we have to get to triple Z. Oh, it's a, it's a graph traversal problem. Oh, this... Hmm. I was going to say it might be tricky to do without structs, because if you have like a binary binary tree, this is, this is like a binary tree because you have one parent node and it has two children nodes. So this is a binary tree. Uh, maybe there are cycles. If there are cycles, it's not a tree. It's a graph. I don't know if you can call that a binary graph or if that's not a thing. <laughs> Is this just a graph problem with Dijkstra? We, I felt like there were about five of these in last year's advent of code. <clears throat> oh. Oh, so we don't have to search. They tell us exactly where to go with RL. RL. So right and then left and then we're there. So this should take six steps. So we go left, left, right. And I guess when we run out of these instructions, we we repeat them do they explicitly yeah repeat okay yeah so we're given three instructions so we go left we go left and then we go right and then we repeat this and we keep repeating these directions until we get to the end so it's it's a graph traversal problem but we don't have to figure out where to go they tell us exactly where to go and we just have to figure out how many steps to get there uh, at least for part one. Uh, my prediction is for part two, we ignore these instructions and just try to find the fastest route from A to Z. Uh, and that would be Dijkstra. You just implement Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, I could be wrong. That might not be part two, so I won't explain what Dijkstra's algorithm is yet. Uh, and I, I don't know if I can implement that in Sintran. I, I think it's recursive. Maybe there's an iterative version of Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay, so how does this take six steps? We go left, takes us to B. We go left, that takes us back to A. And then we go right, but right takes us back to B. And then we're gonna go left, left, right again. So left, left, right. And now we're finally at Z after the second time we go right, which is we go through these three commands two times. So that's the sixth instruction. Okay, we're traversing a graph, 
by graph, I mean some sort of linked list. Not a linked list, because in a linked list, every node points to one other node. In this graph, every node points to, in this case, it's two other nodes. For a general graph, you could have each node linked to an arbitrary number of other nodes. That's the mathematical definition of a graph, not like a 2D XY graph. That's a different kind of graph. All right, what does the real input look like? That's a little big. We have 752 elements in this list, or nodes. I, sh I should call them nodes, not elements. Mm. It could be difficult to just deal with the scale of this. Because how do I want to represent a graph in Sintrain, a programming language that doesn't have structs? I, I could have an adjacency matrix, and then I have a matrix that's 752 by 752 squared. Uh, actually, it's only 750. Right, because the first two lines are the instructions and then a blank line. So we, we only have 750 nodes, but still 750 squared, that's almost a million. What is that, like half a million? Uh, let's use Sintran as a desktop calculator. So 750 squared is half a million, a little over half a million. Uh, I could have a matrix that big in memory, why not? Yeah, half a million, that's like, that's gonna be a few megabytes if I have like three character strings, or three byte strings for, for each node. So every, every node is three characters. All right, uh, let's, let's get to it. So let me get out a day seven. Okay, I, I, I want to read two, two lines outside of the loop. And then maybe I just want to count the lines and pre-allocate everything. Yeah. By the way, the reason I just switched files like that is uh, I have buffers in VI. Uh, maybe I can talk about my setup for a second. Uh, so I have two different files open in NeoVim right now. I have main.sintran and now I have utils.sintran. Uh, actually, I can close one of them. Uh, NeoVim calls these buffers. Basically, a file is a buffer. So BD will be buffer delete two. Now, if I list those again, I only have one buffer open. I only have main open, which is the file right here. Uh, so if I, if I try to tab complete something, like let me get rid of count line. If I hit tab, uh, I forget what the default is in VI, but there's basically tab completion. It's some weird keyboard shortcut, but I have it mapped to the tab key so I can hit tab and that will complete a word. Uh, like if I type F-I-L in tab, I have file names, I also have file if I hit tab again. Uh, but count line does not tab complete because I don't have any count lines in this file yet. Uh, but if I open the file that defines that in NeoVim, and that's defined in dot dot slash dot dot slash utils Sintran, it's two folders up. Uh, now I have that open in a buffer and I can switch back to the original file. Now I'm back in main.sintran, but I have both buffers open. Now I can tab complete across buffers. So here's where I was, I hit tab, and now I have, actually I have two different functions or two different words. It, it's just tab completing a word. It doesn't really know what's a variable or a function or some other keyword. Uh, so I have count. If I hit tab a couple more times, I also have count line. Uh, yeah, so that was just a quick 
Neo Vim rundown. Uh, lo and behold, it takes me to your repository. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what Sintran is. It's it's my own terrible programming language. I, I don't know how long you stuck around yesterday, but I basically got stuck because this is such a terrible programming language. Uh, yeah, so we're going to count the lines in the file. And it should be 752, so I actually want this minus 2 because... We have the instructions, then we have a blank line, and then we actually have the list of the nodes and the graph connections. So the file is 752 lines, but there are only 750 nodes in this graph. Uh, by the way, welcome back to the stream, Smab UK. That did not print n. I think I forgot to save this. No, I, I just didn't print anything. So we have seven. Okay, there are seven. I thought there were six, but there are seven. All right. Now, before we loop, uh, I want to read the instructions. So INSTR is going to be the first line, and then we're just going to read a blank line. This is just a blank line delimiter, uh, but we know the we we know the format of the file uh, for the test input and the real one. But it's always the instructions, then a blank line, and then the nodes. Your missing feature, you can just implement it. Yeah, shouldn't take too long. Uh, I got lucky where a, a few days ago I had to parse like 64-bit integers before I could only parse 32-bit integers. Uh, so, so that was something that I got lucky with. It wasn't too hard to just like copy and paste the 32-bit the parser and then I had a 64-bit parser. Uh, but like today is a day where I think having structs in the language might help and I don't have structs and that would take a very long time for me to implement. So pretty soon I'm going to get stuck in the advent of code. Eric loves 64-bit. So we have a blank line and we know the number of lines in the file now, so I don't need a while loop. I can have a for loop zero through n, and then I want to read the line at the top of the loop. So that should still read the whole file, and I think that is the whole file. Uh, yeah, so we end with z, that's the whole file. Uh, how do I want to represent this? And how do I scale this efficiently? So if, if you have 750 nodes, how, how do you look up the node based on its name. Like how do I find which line a node is defined on? You could loop all the way through the nodes every time you look one up. Uh, maybe we could do that one pass ahead of time and then start traversing the graph. That wouldn't be too painfully slow. That's something you could do with a, a hash map in most languages, but hash maps are another data structure that of course I don't have. Uh, a ternary tree would, could be an, another sort, relatively efficient way to, to look up things based on a string. Uh, that, that's how I look up variable identifiers in the language because like when, when my interpreter is parsing this, this line says let str equals whatever. So this is a variable declaration and what happens is I insert this variable name into a ternary tree. So I insert something into a tree and it's done by name. So it's str underscore and that's in a ternary tree. 
and then whenever I encounter a variable again, I check, is this in the tree? If not, that's good because there's no let keyword here. Otherwise, I have a problem where like a variable is being used which has not been declared, and that's a syntax error. So that's all done with a ternary tree. I have too many structures to choose from sometimes. <laughs> I have the opposite problem. I, I don't have I don't have any options. I, I don't have any data structures. I have arrays, and that's all. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So we know the number of lines. I think I want to pre-allocate a couple things. So we're gonna have a list of nodes. And then we're gonna have a list of the left nodes and the right nodes. So like. This would be a node, and then each node has a left child and a right child. So those are going to be three parallel arrays. It's going to start out as empty strings, and there are n of them. I've been learning lots today reading the .NET source code. Uh, I've, I've never worked with .NET, uh, but when I, when I was making this interpreter, I was following along a YouTube tutorial by a guy that worked in C Sharp. So, so I think that's part of the .NET. So we have nodes, and then we have left children and right children. So lefts, I guess it is plural, and rights, if I can spell. Okay, and how do I want to parse this? Mm, we can split based on the equal sign, and then to the left of the equal sign is the node. And then to the right of the equal sign, we can split based on a comma, and at the same time get rid of the parentheses characters. And then to the... Mm, yeah, and, and spaces too. We can get rid of spaces. And then the left thing of that is going to be the left child and the right is the right child. So we should be able to do that with our split helper function. Mo, yeah, that's the guy. Program manager on .NET. So... Uh, we're going to split the string into a vector of strings. So that's going to be strs equals split. <clears throat> We're splitting the string. And the first delimiter is just the equals sign. Uh, you know what? I, I want to get rid. I want to get rid of all the delimiters on the first split. So it, so actually, I, I only need one split. So I can split by spaces, equals, parentheses, and commas. So equals, spaces, parentheses, and commas. These are all of my delimiters uh, concatenated into one string. And then we should get three things out of this. We should get the node, and the left child, and the right child. So then nodes equals strings zero. Uh, hold on. Nodes i equals strings zero. And then we have the left and the right children. Lefts and rights. Let me verify that one first. Okay, so these are all the nodes in the order that they're declared here. And now I want to make sure I have the left and the right as well. Okay, so left, that's not right. Uh, these are all string zero, so one and then two. So left is B, D, Z, D, E, G, Z, 
and then right is C E G D E G Z. Uh, and for the test input, we, we happen to always have triplets of the same letter, but for the real input, it's it's not like that. Uh, we have like different letters in, in one one string identifier. By the way, did I get the instructions? <clears throat> the instructions, where are they? Uh, uh, yeah, RL for the test input. Okay. Now we have to start following these instructions. Uh, not quite. Before I do that, I want to sort of translate these strings into integers. So when I look something up, I can look it up by integer instead of looking it up by string. Uh, and, and this is going to be slow to build the table because we're going to have to loop through this. Uh, and it's going to be like order n squared. But then once we have that, every time we have to look something up by integer afterwards, it's just a simple table lookup operation. Uh, so in the long run, if we have to, if, if the instructions send us going through this way more than n times, this will be more efficient in the long run. Uh, and again, you could do this even more efficiently by building it with a ternary tree to start out with, but I'm just going to do it with like an n squared table lookup because we have 750 things, that, that should be workable. Uh, yeah, so translate node identifiers to integer indices. Uh, we're gonna, what do I wanna call my indices? Uh, maybe I'll go with IDX again. So let IDX, it will be initialized. How am I going to do this? I think node, nodes IDX is just going to be the identity. So it's going to be 0 through n by definition. And then what we have to do is we have to look up lefts and rights according to these indices. So like we're going to have 0 through n. Let me print this out so you know what I'm talking about. Now, these are my node integer indices. So what I'm defining is that triple A is zero, triple B is one, triple C is two, and, and so on. Uh, so that's the definition of these. Now what I have to do is I have to look up the left and the right children in this and then build up an integer index array for the left children and the right children. So, uh, we're going to allocate those, and when we allocate, we have to initialize. So lefts idx, we're going to initialize it to negative 1. Uh, and notice the colon here versus the semicolon here. So this is just the initial value. It's not going to matter in the long run. But when I have a semicolon, it, it's like setting the whole array to a constant. So every element of this array is a negative one. Uh, that's what happens when you use a semicolon. When you have a colon, you get a range. So this is from zero to one to two, all the way up to six. So that's the difference between a colon and a semicolon in, in this array syntax. Uh, this one, I, I think like a lot of languages use this. Like I, I think Python uses this. Uh, I, I know definitely Fortran and MATLAB use the colon like this. Uh, the semicolon, this is from Rust. So when you have a vector in Rust, uh, if you want to like initialize it to all negative ones, this is exactly how you do this in Rust. I had to write a helper for my C sharp to do that. Uh, are, you, are you doing advent code? Did you already do day eight here?
so I don't really need to print this. Cool. Uh, so I just have to iterate through everything. Uh, I, I want to initialize, maybe I'll just do the left ones for now, and then doing the right ones should be like copying and pasting whatever we implement for the left children. So for i, I, I think I already have this loop for i in that range. <clears throat> uh, Yeah, then we're going to have an inner loop heading to bed soon. All right, yeah, uh, have a good night, man. Yeah, it, it's going to take me a while to do part one because uh, in a brand new programming language, I have to write all of the helper functions because there's almost nothing built into the language. So it, it takes a lot of time just to, just to get the basics running. Uh, then I'm going to have an inner loop. And we're gonna look up. We're gonna look up left's i inside the nodes array. Thanks. So while j is less than n, at the end of this loop we have to increment j. Uh, yeah. And not found. So let found equals false. And when we find the left child in the node array, we're going to assign the left index. And that will happen when nodes j equals left i. And then this better be found. Uh, if if you don't, if if you have nodes that are the children that aren't defined in on like the left side of the equal sign, then the the problem is impossible. So this better be found at some point in the loop. And then we're going to set left's idx equals, mm, yeah, nodes idx j. That's not what I wanted to type. So this one is i. And, and I'm now realizing that I don't really need an array for this because it's the identity. I could just have j, not nodes idxj on the right hand side of this equal sign. Uh, Yeah, so let's let's see if that makes sense. And if that works, then we have to do the same thing for the right children. Well, the that is clearly an uninitialized number. Uh How did that happen? Oh. Yeah, I think that's right. So we're going through this loop and then we actually find the thing and we increment j one more time. So I have to undo that last incrementation and then use j minus one right here. So does this make sense? The left thing, the first left thing is the second node. So one instead of zero, it's, it's the second one. So B is here. And then the next left thing is the fourth node. So D matches D. I think that's correct. Uh, now we have to do the same thing for the right side. <clears throat> I think I might just copy and paste.
That should be it. Uh, yeah, this is already declared. Okay, now this C is down here, so that's why you have a two here. I think that makes sense. And then do we have repetition? So we have E and then we have E again. So we have four and then we have four again. So those make sense. I think these lookups are correct. And now that we have these integer tables, we can look things up quickly while we're actually traversing the graph. Because we can just do a table lookup or like, you know, index an array instead of like searching through a list of strings to figure out which string matches. Okay, uh, yeah, now we just have to follow the instructions, which is like, I, I think the test input, it's just right, left, and then we repeat right, left again and again. Uh, and, and how long does this take for this input? right and then left it, it only takes like two steps for the test input uh, and what is the destination so is there a zzz are we searching for zzz or are we searching for the last thing i, I think we're searching for zzz Yeah, Z, Z, Z. I mean, f for the test input, it wasn't clear because it, it's also at the end of the nodes. Yeah, yeah, but they explicitly say it here. Cool. Uh, Now we're going to traverse the graph according to the instructions. And then while not nodes i equals Z, Z, Z. No, I don't actually have a string not equals operator, so I have to do equals and then put the not out here. That, this should be a thing that's pretty quick to implement. That makes me sleepy, huh? all the Zs. Uh, yeah, and then we're gonna have like a modulo operator because it's gonna depend on the length of the instructions. Let me get that actually. So INSTR, we're gonna let N INSTR equals the length of the instructions. So for the test input, it's two. And for the other test input, because they give us two different test inputs for the other one, it's three. Yeah, I, I need parentheses. <laughs> of course, I'm in an infinite loop because I started a while loop and then I never filled out the body of the while loop, but the number of instructions is two, and that's all I wanted. At the end of this, we're going to increment i. And you, you could just do a modulo operation right here, but we also want to keep track of the total number of loop iterations that we do. So I don't want to do the modulo here. I want to do the modulo when I look up the instructions. Uh, yeah, so the instruction, I'm, I'm going to have a temporary variable just so I can print it and make sure that this works. So let ins equals instruction i mod n inst. So when we get to the end of the array, we're going to loop around, and that all, all gets taken care of by this modulo operator. Uh, 
uh, and this is still going to be an infinite loop. So how how is that not an infinite loop? Oh, yeah, be because I'm just. We, we need another index, but the instruction is right, left, right, left, right, left. So we're just repeating the instructions and that's, that's all I really wanted to do. Uh, the, re the rest of this loop wasn't set up yet anyway. So I actually want to have J also. So let J equal zero. And then that's that. So I, we just increment by one to count Count, count the number of steps through the loop and to look up the instruction, but then J is going to look up the node, and that's going to get set according to whether we go to the left child or the right child. So, uh, J equals, we're going to look up, uh, it, it depends on the current instruction. So if INS equals left, we're going to do one thing, and otherwise we're going to do something else. So if it's left, then j is left's idx j. Because j is the current node. So we're looking at the left child of node j. And if it's not left, then it's right. Uh, so we don't really need an else if, just else is good enough. I think that's that should be it for part one, uh, unless I have a bug in here somewhere, and that's totally possible. So we basically did it two steps. We did two instructions and then it stopped, but I actually failed to print the answer. So all I have to print is uh, sum equals i. Seems right to me. Yeah. Uh, let's let's try it on the real input. Hey, this is pretty good timing. It's only been 42 minutes. I, I think usually it's taken longer than that for part one for me on most days. I hope this doesn't take more than a few seconds. Shouldn't that answer be six though? No, because uh, there were two different test inputs. So uh, for this test input, which is the one that I saved, it happens in two steps. And then for the other test input that they give us, but I never actually tested for this one, it takes six, but the one that I tested should be two. Uh, is this still running? Maybe I have a bug. Maybe this is an infinite loop. I'm going to give this like 30 more seconds, 30 seconds right now. Yeah, printing it, printing it takes a long time. So what I can do is I can kill this, comment out the prints and run it again. Uh, but you know, what, what if it's almost done Then I don't want to kill it right now. So I'll give it like 10 more seconds. It's a higher number than you were thinking of. Okay, yeah, so, so I, I probably should comment out the prints because that really does slow it down. Even in an inefficient high-level interpreted language, the prints still slow it down. All right, yeah, it's time to kill that. So, uh, before I do that, I wanna double check the test input. So I, I also wanna print the node that I'm on, so. Uh, and I, I want to do that on the test input because it's A, C, and then we get to Z. Maybe run it through the other test data. Uh, 
that would be a good idea. I, I think I'm going to skip it because we have A and then next we go to C and then we're at the end. So that node seems correct. Let's go back to the real input. You're probably right. I really should check this on the other test input, but I have a good feeling about this. So this is just echoing the input and now it's traversing the graph without printing a million times. I should probably have a cap on this, maybe like five minutes. If, if, this, if this starts to take longer than five minutes, then uh, I'll go back and test the other input. To be fair, both parts worked first time for me. That never happens. Yeah. Uh, pretty frequently there's something that I mess up. So I'm, I'm not going to rule that out here, but I, I do have a good feeling about today. I, I feel better about today than I felt about the poker game yesterday. I felt like that was more difficult. Okay, at least I have these indices printed out. I don't know. I, I'm not seeing any numbers that are like 2 billion or anything unexpected. There are like between 0 and 749. So it's, it's a good sanity check, at least. Sorry for the dead silence. I don't really have anything to talk about other than sit around in suspense waiting for this to finish. 10 milliseconds. Uh, what language did you use? C sharp. Uh... I, I mean, C sharp is compiled, right? It, it's not interpreted, so it should be pretty fast. I mean, your solution should be pretty fast, and mine is kind of slow because it's interpreted. How's my memory usage? Okay, this is good. The, the last couple days I've had memory leaks in both problems, but today my memory is holding constant because I don't really have any functions that I'm calling. I'm just doing everything in the main program. Three more minutes and I will kill this and run the other test input. A number in the 20,000 range. So, so what I could do is I could also like print a number every 1,000 iterations and then uh, I, I could have like a almost a progress bar. Not exactly a progress bar because I don't know what the endpoint is, but if you say it's like around 20,000, then that would give me an idea. But I'm not prepared to give up yet. Uh, my suspicion is that Sintran is just super slow. So you did it in 10 milliseconds, maybe mine will take five minutes. I can at least look at the input. I don't know how to scroll in Tmux. I'm just using my mouse scroll wheel, but like I don't know how to jump to the end other than like killing whatever whatever I'm running. Do we have any like numbers in here or anything weird? Okay, no. No numbers. 
All the commas are right there. Everything has parentheses around it. I want to make sure there are like no funny characters that I wasn't prepared to deal with in the input, but it's it they're all they're all alphabetical, uppercase alphabetical. All right, one more minute and I'll kill this. Total for all days comes in at a quarter second, the uh, the runtime for everything combined. That's pretty good. That's that's way better than I'm doing. <clears throat> well, just in anticipation, I will save the other test input. So let's call this test input two dot txt. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm gonna kill this and run the other test input. You have a target of one second. Uh, did you do this last year? I, I, there were a few days that I really struggled with last year. Per puzzle part, yeah, that, that's very reasonable if you can do one second. Uh, there were a couple days last year where you had to use dynamic programming, but I actually don't know anything about dynamic programming. Like, I, I can do Dijkstra's algorithm, but there were, there were days last year where you, you had to, like, unlock steam valves or something like that, and for that, it was... It, I really couldn't do that. Uh, and there was, there was a second dynamic programming problem last year. Okay, three days I didn't complete last year. Probably the same problems, yeah. Uh, the second dynamic programming problem last year, I think it was day 19, I couldn't even get part one. Okay, I'm officially killing this. I, I only started last year, so I, I didn't do 2021. I've done some of the problems from 2020 as a warm-up for this year, and then I did some of 2019 because 2019 had int code, and I heard everybody talking about int code and like how great those problems were. So let's try the other test input. Okay, yeah, it's six for the other test input. Let me like print out the nodes to verify that those are correct. So, yeah, A, left, B, left again, back to A, and then right, that takes us to B, then left takes us back to A. Uh, I get confused about which instruction I'm on. I think it says right, so then we go to B, and then right again. I, I think this is correct. I, I got confused part way through there, but we got six and that part is definitely correct. I did half of 2018 as a warm up this year. I, I haven't looked at 2018 at all. So I, I think I'm gonna add in that progress bar that you gave me the idea for, since you said it's gonna be like ballpark 20,000. Uh, if if i mod do i want to do a hundred I, I think i'll do every thousand I, I think i should get through a thousand pretty quick like if it's if it's only twenty thousand I, I don't know why this took so long to run so if the modulo is that i'm gonna print i and i'm gonna print the node uh, might as well print the instruction too, just to like make sure that they're valid strings and I'm not like going out of bounds of some index or anything weird. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, let's add some extra safeguards in here. Instruction equals R, we do this and else, I, I don't have an exit or abort or uh, like assert, I don't have anything like that. So I'm just gonna print 
error. Bad instruction. Uh, non bull. Yeah, that is a non bull condition. This is the test input. So I need to go back to the real input. That's way over 20,000. We're in the millions already. Two million, three million. Yeah, so this doesn't look good. I guess I have some kind of bug. But how? I think you may have a bug. I, I agree. Uh, am I using the right indices everywhere? So the instructions are indexed by i. And i gets incremented every time we go around. And it's not really i, it's i modulo n i n s t r. And then the i index is not used anywhere else. I have ZZZ on the I have ZZZ on the right child. I have ZZZ as a node, and uh, so I never have ZZZ as a left child. There's only one way to get to ZZZ. Wait, what am I? Don't I? Oh, I print the indices, but I don't actually print the left children as strings anymore. So what I could do is verify that I'm looking up the tables correctly. Uh, I don't actually need this variable because it's just the identity mapping. So everywhere we have this. I can just delete it. Is this Fortran? Not exactly. Uh, this is Sintran. Sintran is an interpreted programming language, and I wrote the interpreter for this in Fortran. So at, at some level, it is Fortran, but this is not Fortran. Welcome to the stream, Kane. Apparently, I have some bug because Smab UK tells me that this should finish in about 20,000 iterations, and I have both of the test inputs working. But when I run the real input, it just goes through millions of steps without getting to ZZZ. So I deleted that. Let's print every 100,000. Okay, so this is a more manageable progress bar. It's not flooding my screen anymore. Part two is fun. I hope so. I, I struggled with day five. I struggled a little bit with day seven yesterday. I actually didn't get part two of day seven yet. I think I can. I just need to spend more time on it. 
So I'm hoping that today isn't as difficult as those other two harder days. Yeah, I need to debug more things. So, uh, I want to make sure I'm looking up all of these indices correctly. So, uh, I feel like reused N for something that I'm not supposed to. I, I think I can get this. I, I don't know why I'm struggling here. I, I, I'm in like 10 minutes, I'm going to find something stupid and I'm going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe that was the bug. How did I miss that for so long? But I just don't know what it is yet. So we have N and N is the number of nodes in the graph. Does your language support <laughs> longer variable names? Uh, yeah, it does. I, I just like to use short variable names. Yeah. I, J, N, IDX, those are, those are my preferred variable names. So I, I want to make sure that I looked up these indices correctly. So I'm going to print, first we're going to verify the left children. So left, left equals, it's going to be lefts i, and then that should be the same as nodes with a different index, and I can look that index up with lefts idx i. So this should be the same as this if I've looked up the indices correctly, I think. Let me t that actually. Okay, so, so I need a space in there, but we have VLG, VLG, uh, PRK, PRK. So that's what I expected. Uh, and, and then I want to assert that this is true. So if, 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 these, are, if these do not match, I, I want to do something so I can see it. So SBP, spot checking a few of them seems okay. Let me do this methodically. So instead of printing that, if not that thing equals the other thing, uh, then we're gonna print left mismatch. need parentheses. I, I really need a string not equals operator. So I don't see any mismatches. Uh, let me check the rights. Okay, no mismatches. Is, is that what I printed? Mismatch? Yeah, I, I did not find that. Uh, let's also check the right children. So the right indices should be looked up in the same way. Your answer appears to be the highest at around like 20,000 and I'm getting well into the millions and still not reaching the end. Mm.
Yet no mismatches. Is this string actually 263 long? Uh, yep, so my text editor says 263. That makes sense. Let, let me print these as well, verbosely, the right side. How do you start traversing your nodes? So I start, that's a good question. So I start with j equals zero. And then, it should always start at triple A. Uh, that might be it. Oh my God, that's it. <laughs> I'm not starting at AAA. Uh, maybe I would have figured that out in 10 more minutes. Uh, like, like I'm, I'm not mad that you spoiled it for me. Uh, I'm glad you saved me the time. Because, like, I'm not doing this competitively. I, I don't care. Uh, yeah, so th that's definitely it. I did not start at AAA. I just started at, I just started at TFN in, in, instead of AAA. Yeah, that's definitely it. Uh, so I have to look that up. <laughs> so instead of starting at j equals zero, we have to look up location of AAA. That, yeah, that should do it. Uh, Man, why do they give you the test inputs like this where AAA is just at the beginning? I, I noted that ZZZ was not at the end. Uh, Smab UK was here. I was like, oh, ZZZ isn't at the end for the input. Uh, but then like, I failed to check that for AAA being at the start. Yeah, I'm, I'm still on part one. Uh, oh, d does part two say like start at J equals Z or instead of start at AAA? Eric, who, who is Eric by the way? Is, is he like another streamer? Uh, he is, oh, the creator of the puzzles. Okay, I, I should have known that. Oh yeah, I didn't get your earlier comment when you said that like Eric, yeah, Eric loves 64-bit. I, I didn't know who you were talking about, but yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That was like my last frantic step for the Sintran language. Just a few weeks ago, I had to add 64-bit integers because I knew like he's going to make me use 64-bit integers in like day three or day five or something. Uh... Yeah, so that should get us the initial value of J for the next loop. Uh, I, I think that's it. L let me redo the test input. Well, wow, that's really weird. If you start at the first node, you're in a completely disconnected part of the graph. Or, or somehow the instructions magically never get you to triple Z. So it's like there must be two components of the graph that are not connected. And if you start at zero instead of starting at triple A, you're in the wrong part of the graph and you can never get to triple Z. So like they very carefully designed this puzzle input so that if you misread it like I did, yeah, you, you get trapped in an infinite loop. I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, did I not declare? Yeah, I, I did not declare. So, so I still have to initialize it to zero for, for the initial search, but then I'm not setting j equals zero before this loop. We're just taking it from whatever this loop ends at. Yeah, yeah, the test samples were not like this, but the real input has, 
it, it probably has two disconnected graphs. Either that, or it's very carefully instruct, carefully crafted instructions that will never take you to the to the goal of the puzzle or the goal of the the maze. What am I doing? Yeah, I, I don't actually need to print this. I, I was in the middle of debugging this, and then uh, Max Dars figured out the bug. So we don't need to debug that. OK, we, we still get two for, part, for the test input. And then if we do the real input, all right, yeah, around 20,000. Man, that was that was almost embarrassing. I, I I I do something like this every day. I I miss something in the prompt, and then I have to spend like ten minutes very carefully rereading every paragraph of the prompt. Okay, that's part one. to do this in parallel now? One one A and two two A. Okay, so th this shouldn't be too bad. I, j I just have to make some of my scalars into vectors and, and add like a, an extra loop or two. So we're following like two paths in parallel. So we have like the left path. I I'm going to overload the word left, but let's call these the left paths. We actually get to the goal. But then because the right one isn't at the goal yet, we keep going. And we, we don't pause this one at the goal. We continue this one too. And then we have to keep going them until all of them happen to get to the goal at the same time. So I, I think I understand this. Uh, I, need to, I need to refill my drink and I need to feed my cat. So I will be right back before I continue with part two. I'll be right back.
Okay, we are back. It's time for part two. So let me start out with some copying and pasting. I'm gonna copy and paste part one, and that's going to become part two. And before I even change anything, I'm just gonna run part one twice with the test input. Uh, yeah. I have a bunch of like debug printing and I'll clean that up at some point, but I'll do that after I get it solved. Okay. Now for part two, basically we're gonna turn a bunch of the scalars into vectors. Uh, and and dis despite SMAB UK's good advice, I'm gonna keep using uh, single thread as possible. Yeah, so uh, like it's conceptually in parallel, but I'm, I'm gonna run it in single thread. Uh, I, I'm gonna not follow SMAB UK's advice to use longer variable names. I'm going to stick with my short names. <clears throat> So this still needs to be a scalar. We're reading reading the input file serially, or just there, there's just one input file. But then in some places, I'm I'm gonna want to have loop iterators that are vectors. This part is just translating the node identifiers to integer indices, so that can stay the same. Uh, and this was just debugging, so I actually don't need this loop at all. We're still going to have the counter i. That's going to be a scalar, because at the end, we just want to know how many steps did it take. And that is a scalar. And then we have to look up the start locations, but it's every start location that ends in an a. So if we do that in terms of regular expressions, it's dot star a, well, really it's dot dot a, because it has to be three characters. Uh, I think I need like an ends with helper function. Because I have a problem in Sintran and I don't know how I want to solve this. When I have a vector of strings, if I index the vector, I get a whole string out of this. So like I can compare this to AAA. Or if, if I have one scalar string, I can index that to get a character out of the string. But when I have a vector of strings and I want to get a character out of it, I don't have any way to subscript that. So... Uh, like I think what I, what I would like to do is have like uh, an extra index. So I say like nodes two j. That would be the last character of node j, and then I could just see if that's uh, see if that's a. But I I don't have this in the language because then I have to I have to have weird rules about like how many subscripts an array can have. It can either be the rank of the array or it can be the rank of the array plus one if it's a string. Uh, and that's like a really weird parsing rule that I have to figure out how I want to implement. <clears throat> and j is actually going to be a vector. And before I even do that, I have to count how many nodes end with a. <laughs> I'm going to have another short variable name. Uh, number of nodes that end with a going to be na. That's going to be initialized to zero, and then we're going to loop through all the nodes and count how many of them end with a. I think I don't really need brackets here because it's basically going to be a one-liner. Uh, if ends with nodes j a, then na plus equals one. Uh, 
and I have to implement this function. I'm going to put that in my utilities script. So it takes one string and then I don't actually have a character type. So the character is also a string type. I just have to be very careful to pass it a string of length one when I want to have a character. Uh, th this, this could take two strings. You could have, you could have a function that checks if a, if a string ends with another substring, uh, but I only want to implement this for characters. This will return a Boolean. Uh, and this, this is a one-liner function. So it will say string length of string equals care. And I think that's it. So am I running the test input? Yeah, I'm still running a test input. Uh, but the test input that they give us isn't really very helpful because there's only one that ends with A. So we're going to have like a third test input now that I have to copy and paste and save in a file. Uh, oh, There should be a comma here instead of a colon. And J has not been declared. That should actually be I. It's good to have type checking sometimes. Well, it's no, it's it's not type checking. It's just checking if variables have been declared or not. <clears throat> so N A is zero. That's not right. We we should at least count this one. Oh, it's the length minus one. So, so that was an out of bounds array index and, and there's no bounds checking yet. I, I think I need to have like separate debug and release interpreters and the debug one will check bounds every time I have an array subscript and the release one won't because it's the wild west. Okay, so we have one node that ends with A. That makes sense for this input, but this input isn't really interesting. So let's edit test input three. And I have to save that. And now how many should, I, I think there are just two. Yeah, the puzzle prompt said that there were two. Uh, and I have to tell this to load that new file. Line 14 in main, oh, trailing commas, those are bad. <clears throat> What do you guys think about trailing commas? I, I don't know what languages support this. I, I think JSON doesn't. I, I think Rust allows you to do this. Like you can have an array separated by commas. And if you have an extra comma at the end, it's fine. It's not the case in this language. PHP does. Uh, yeah, I've, I've not used PHP. I, I, th I, th I think I like that feature. Ooh. N A something bad happened. Did I save the test input? What happened? Zero one two three. So this should load this file. Where is this crashing?
do part one. What happened? I think part one is crashing. Why would part one crash? Is that what's happening? And then if part one crashes, part two is probably also going to crash. Yes. But now it says starting part two. Uh, there's, yeah, there's no triple A. Yeah. <laughs> Duh. Oh man. That makes a lot of sense. So I'm just not going to run part one for now while I look at this other test input. And then I, I don't have an early return or an exit. So. Well, it's printing NA and we're getting we're getting the NA that we expect because there are two that end with A. So now I just have to implement the rest of part two. But I want to look up all of these and now J has to be a vector instead of a scalar. So let J equals OneDrive is not signed in. I don't give a fuck. I, I need to uninstall OneDrive because I, I get that pop-up like every day and I just X out of it because I, I, I don't even use OneDrive. So J is going to be a vector. Why is this popping up? I don't care. J is going to be a vector and its length is NA. NA is the number of nodes that ends with A. My variable names are short, but they make sense to me. So, so that's my defense against the very good advice that I should probably have longer variable names. No harm there. Well, it's it's no harm because it's AOC. If I was writing like production code that anybody else would ever have to maintain, this probably would be a bad thing. Uh, and then we have to put another loop around this because we, we're going to want to find all of the nodes that end with J. And, and we're also going to change this condition because it's not a strict equality. It's going to be ends with again. So uh, this is going to loop up to NA now. While not ends with nodes j just one a again I, I don't really need brackets there and now this is j indexed by i i'm just going to comment out the next loop Uh, comment out that too, because now I is maybe uninitialized. Oh, okay, there's I. Anyway, let's see what those indices are. Non-integer subscript. Yeah, this is J, I. So that's not right. Oh, okay. I, I, I found this one, but I found it twice. So yeah, I just need to rethink the way that this loop works. Uh, This doesn't need to be a loop. Uh, 
this is getting really confusing now because I have I, J, and K, but I'm, I'm used to doing stuff like this. This is my comfort zone. So if ends with nodes J, no, if node I ends with A, and, and we don't have like a nested subscript anymore, it's, it's just nodes I, if that's the case, then j k equals i and increment k. Now, now we should have unique entries for j if I did that right. Nope. Did I save this? Is this part two? This is part two. This has to loop up to n. Okay, so zero ends with an a and zero, one, two, three also ends with an a. So those are the j indices that I want. And now, this next loop has to be parallel. And, and where, where do we want to end? Do we end when we get the triple Z, or do we end when it just ends with Z? So for this, how do ghosts travel? until they all simultaneously end up at nodes that end with Z. So I don't have to end up at triple Z, I just have to end up at this or something like this. Yeah, one one Z or two two Z, okay. While not all ends with nodes I would like to have this in the language eventually, where you can subscript an array with another array and get an array out, but I don't have that yet. Uh, for now, I have to subscript an array with a scalar. So I'm gonna pass nodes, and I'm gonna pass the subscript array, and then I'm gonna pass the thing that I wanna check if it ends with, and that's, that's how this helper function all ends with is going to work. And then we're gonna to have to fix up some stuff in this loop because J is a vector now. But I wanna implement this helper function. Read very carefully what they wrote. It's a bit ambiguous and not clear. It will save you a lot of time. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely did that a few days ago, but I, 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 think, I think I understand today's problem. I definitely misread the first part, uh, and I'm glad that, uh, was that you? I think, yeah, you're the one that pointed out my, my misreading of part one, but I, I think I have part two. It's just a question of implementation. So function all ends with, it's gonna take a string vector <clears throat> and an index vector. Part two is not clear. Uh, I, I think, unless it's really bad, I, I think some of that is intentional. 
I think sometimes they, they just don't explain things fully, and then that's like part of the puzzle that you have to read it very closely. Uh, it, at least that's how I felt in, in one of the last few days. I don't know. That, that's just my opinion. I, I don't really know anything about puzzle design. But I think like if they spell everything out for you very explicitly and give you like too many examples, then then it's not as hard. So this helper function, it's going to loop through every string in this vector of strings. Uh, well, well, not every one of them, just the indices that I provide. And then it's going to check if each of those elements of the string vector end with a character. And if it finds one that doesn't end, it's going to break out of this loop early and just return. So all end. And then this is not the size that I want. I want to do the size of the index array. All end equals strings j i. Now I'm now I have nested indices because we're we're like we have another level of indirection. We're looking up element i of the index array, and then we're looking up that index in the string vector. So if ends with that thing and the character. And then we have to increment i and return the answer. Now, here we need another loop. We have to loop through all of the j's because j is now a vector, it's not a scalar. And that's gonna be a loop up to na. na is the number of nodes that end with a. So, I need, I need k. Because i is my counter, and then that's like my final answer. So I want to make sure that this is initialized to 0 right before the loop, because I've used it here. I think my scoping rules are that this is like a local variable inside this for loop scope. So if I initialized i to 0 further up, it should still be 0 in this scope. Uh, but I want to do it here just in case I don't remember how my own language works. Uh, that's It's very likely that I've forgotten. And now I need a k that iterates through the j indices. So let k for k in 0 through the number of things that end in a, n a. So j k and j k and j k I think the type checker should help me but let me search uh, so there's this function takes a vector here this I can't print that anymore I'm just not gonna bother with it because hopefully I don't need this debugging block uh, this has a subscript. All of these have subscripts. That's good. I think that might be it. This probably won't compile, or like it won't parse. This is an interpreted language, so there is no compilation. But there is like a parse time type checking and then an evaluation stage. So I think it might fail to parse because I made some 
Mistake. Six. Six. Was that right for the test input? I would be surprised if I got that in one shot. Six. That's that's some kind of miracle. Will that work for the t for the real input? <clears throat> one. We'll select this file names and then set the file name to that thing of the file name vector. The moment of truth. How long will this take? I might have another infinite loop if I've messed something up. Hundred thousand. I think Smab UK went to bed and left the stream. If he's if they're really in the UK, what is it like two AM there? I guess that's a reasonable bedtime. I have no idea how big of a number we're looking for. <clears throat> 